visitors to New York City who venture in to the large building known as the United Nations are amazed to find that there is a meditation room. The meditation room, ladies and gentlemen, is 30 feet long, 18 feet wide at the entrance, which faces north-northeast, and 9 feet wide at the other end. It is, therefore, wedge-shaped. Its only entrance is through two tinted glass-paned doors outside of which stands a United Nations guard. Inside the room is another guard. Once through the doors, the visitor finds himself in a darkened corridor which leads to the left. The sharp transition from a world of light to one of extreme darkness forces a feeling of abrupt withdrawal from the outside world upon the senses of the visitor who walks along the corridor, reaches the inner arced entrance, turns right, and then looks into the room. The room is very dimly lit. The only source of light at first glance is that which is reflected squarely from the gleaming upper surface of the brooding, somber altar in the center of the room. A special lens recessed in the ceiling focuses a beam of light on the altar from a point above and just beyond its far edge. Thin lines of bluish light lap the edges of the shadow cast by the altar. The acoustical properties of the room are unique. The edges of padding material behind the paneling on the walls can be detected at the ceiling level. This absorbs sound, as does the Swedish woven blue rug which covers the floor of the corridor and the back of the room. The room is as quiet as an underground tomb. Its floor is paved with blue-gray slate slabs laid in a haphazard pattern. At the edge of the rug are two very low railings extending out from the east and west walls of the room. The center space between the railings is some six feet in width. To the right of the inner entrance are ten low wicker benches arranged in two rows of three and one back row of four against the corridor wall. Attempts by visitors to pass the railings are discouraged by the guard. The mural is a fresco which was painted originally on wet plaster one section at a time by the artist with the aid of an expert in this work brought from Europe. It is set into a steel-framed narrow panel projected from the wall, behind which is an enclosed area, some six inches deep, which has its own light source. A small square projector, set close against the front base of the altar, throws a diffused beam of light from a recessed aperture upon the surface of the mural. There are also ten hidden lights, five on each side of the room, behind the upper edges of a thin suspended ceiling which extends out over the room from the top of the mural. The eighteen-inch space between the two ceilings contains the light control apparatuses. The lower ceiling is wedge-shaped and separated from three walls of the inner room by a foot-wide space. Thus the room appears appears to be much longer than it really is because of the many converging lines leading into the narrow end, the corners of which are rounded off on either side of the mural. The altar is four feet high and rests on two narrow cross pieces. It is a dark gray block of crystalline iron ore from a Swedish mine and weighs six and one-half tons. The Swedish government presented this block of ore, the largest of its kind ever mined, to the United Nations in early 1957. The chunk rests on a concrete pillar that goes straight down to bedrock. The area and passageway beneath the room are closed to the public. The chunk of ore has been described as a lodestone or magnetite, which is strongly magnetic and which possesses polarity. In northern Sweden are what may be the largest magnetite deposits in the world believed to have been formed by segregation in the magma. Magma is the term for molten material held in solution under the pressure of the Earth's crust. The fresco mural was described in the United Nations Review of January 1958 as having been designed, quote, to conform with the purity of line and color sought for what Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld has called a room of stillness, unquote.
It was painted predominantly in shades of grays and blues, but includes yellow and white patterns and a black half sphere. Light, pure colors intersect to form deeper shades. The New York Times described the fresco as being eight feet eight inches in height and six feet eight inches in width, more brightly illuminated at the top than at the bottom. Bobesco, an old friend of Dag Hammarskjöld, painted the mural. Quote, Dag had me start sketches on this last summer, unquote, he said. Quote, he wanted me to do the actual work right here in the room, so I have been here since October 6, 1957, unquote. The mural was seen for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, on November the 11th, 1957. During the period of the remodeling, the guards were on hand during the day to keep out the curious, and at night the room was locked up with a chain and padlock. The artist said of his work, quote, it has no title, and you can make what you wish of it, unquote. He explained that the geometric patterns in the mural repeated the proportions of the room and those of the focal point of the room, the piece of iron ore. He also said that he intended to give a feeling of space with the picture. The United Nations Review story stated that, quote, he sought to open up the room so that the eye can travel in the distance when it strikes the wall, to give a slight upward movement he said he designed winding circles in a spiraling diagonal line which might be compared to a vibrating musical chord. As a resting spot for the viewer's eyes, he provided one spot of black amid the light colors, a half circle at which all lines of the fresco and the room converge. In the New Yorker story cited earlier, Besco was quoted as saying, quote, My fresco contained no intentional symbols, though I've heard people say that the black and pale blue circle in the upper middle section of the panel stands for the cosmos. All that I seriously sought to do was to open up the wall in order to let the eye travel farther, and to open up the mind, provoking meditation, but not directing it. Unquote. The mystic P. D. Auspensky has written that in Quote, real art, nothing is accidental. It is mathematics. Everything in it can be calculated. Everything can be known beforehand. The artist knows and understands what he wants to convey, and his work cannot produce one impression on one man and another impression on another, presuming, of course, they are people on one level. At the same time, the same work of art will produce different impressions on people of different levels, and people from lower levels will never receive from it what people of higher levels receive. This is real objective art. An objective work of art affects the emotional, and not only the intellectual side of man." Unquote. Mr. Besco's picture is described as non-objective, yet its composition admittedly reflects the dimensions of the room and the chunk of iron ore. This, ladies and gentlemen, involves mathematics. He said of his mural, quote, You can make what you wish of it, unquote, yet he admittedly sought to create a specific subjective effect in the mind of the spectator. Consequently, Mr. Besco's remarks create confusion rather than understanding. The leaflet made available to those who visit the meditation room was written under the direction of Dag Hammarskjöld himself. Its description of the room is deliberately couched in abstruse language. It contains terms which have meaning to the esoterically inclined, but not to the uninitiated, are those called the profane. These terms will be explained and have, in fact, been explained during the Mystery Babylon segments of the Hour of the Time. But for those who may be just beginning to listen to this program, esoteric means that which is hidden and is kept only for the initiated, those who have studied the mysteries. The profane, ladies and gentlemen, is you. I leave myself out because... During the process of studying the mysteries, I, I, with great irony, have become illumined. And if you continue to listen to the Hour of the Time, so shall you. <laughs> 